James slid his fingers down my waist and tucked them into my back pocket, bending over to kiss me on the cheek. We stood like that, in our freshly manicured front lawn, watching the movers carry our furniture up the front steps and into our new home. In our old apartment, on the outskirts of the city, that furniture had felt large and compact, like a can of sardines. It was difficult to even maneuver to the fridge and back. Here, in the suburbs, where every house was a cream-coloured, cookie-cutter copy of each other, it would feel like dollhouse decor. I took James by the wrist, removing his hand from my backside and giving him a coy smile. Our honeymoon phase hadn't really ever ended. Not since we started dating, and definitely not since our wedding. I didn't think it ever would. Is this too much? I asked, resting my head on his shoulder. It'll feel so empty with just the two of us. For now, he muttered, and I could feel him smiling. We had never even really discussed starting a family, just because it felt so implied. We could always just read each other's minds like that. I knew he wanted kids as soon as possible. But I also knew he knew I wanted to wait a little longer, and he respected that. It was inevitable but not a priority. I looked around. I always found neighbourhoods like this one a little creepy. They felt simulated and devoid of actual life. But not this one. Somehow, even though the houses were the same, they each felt different. The home to our left appeared empty, with a colourful for sale sign on the lawn but the one to our right was lively. The windows were adorned with bright pink flowers overflowing from their pots, and the yard was sprinkled with children's toys. Even now, there were kids outside, a young boy who appeared around 12 years of age, pushing a younger girl on a yellow swing set. Their laughter filled the air. Hello. A cheerful voice called, and I turned to see a woman marching towards us, with a gleaming smile on her face. She was beautiful and young, maybe around my age, with blonde hair tied up in a pristine ponytail. Her pants fit her perfectly, accentuating her feminine curves, and her blouse was bunched up around her pregnant stomach. I felt myself subconsciously cross my arms insecure. Hello, my husband replied, bringing me out of my daze. I realised the woman was holding a dish wrapped in tinfoil and steaming. You're the new neighbours, I presume? She asked, her smile only brightening, revealing her perfectly white teeth. Yes, I said, not wanting her to think I was rude. I'm Adeline. This is James. We're so excited. This is such a lovely neighbourhood. As are we. My husband and I were so pleased to hear a young couple were moving in. It really is the perfect place to raise a family. She said knowingly, glancing at her children and then back at us. Oh, We don't have kids, I said, a nervous laugh bubbling up in my throat. Oh, she exclaimed. Her smile seemed to falter, but almost as if it were a glitch. It was so brief. She held out the dish in her hands. Tuna casserole. James took it from her peeling back some of the foil and taking a whiff. Smells delicious. We never caught your name, I said, 
leaning into my husband's side. You are... The woman opened her mouth, but no words came out. I waited for her to answer. Honey. A gruff voice called from the neighbor's doorway. It seemed almost unnaturally loud. Not as if he was yelling, but like his voice was amplified somehow. The woman smiled at us again apologetically. I must be going, she said, resting her hands on her stomach. We will have to get together sometime. James and I only had the time to nod before she was turning away, walking quickly back towards who I assumed must be her husband. I saw something move on the second floor of their house, baby blue curtains parting. I looked up and met the eyes of two more children. They appeared to be twin girls, maybe four or five. One of them waved, the other just stared. Embarrassingly enough, we didn't get to eat the casserole until several days later. Those days were full of hauling heavy boxes from our car and putting everything where it belonged and my ears still rung with the sound of drills as I took the baking dish out of the freezer to thaw. It'll be nice to eat something other than takeout, James said, sitting at our kitchen table and resting his head in his hands. Yeah, I replied, but I'm not sure how I feel about day-old tuna. I walked over, nudging him with my hip, he pulled out his chair, guiding me down on his lap and wrapping his arms around my waist. There was so much excitement in the air as we had set up our new home, but I felt like we hadn't had any time to settle in yet. I had barely been alone with him in any meaningful way. It was the first time since our wedding day that we hadn't been all over each other. He pressed his mouth against my collarbone training his lips up my neck and to my ear. I felt a giggle rise in my chest, running my fingers through his slightly oily hair. When's the last time you showered? I teased, and I felt him laugh against my skin. I was waiting for you, my love. I smiled. You are disgusting. We'd better hurry up and eat, then. The oven dinged, letting me know it was preheated. It took everything in me to get up, off of James. Right as my fingers wrapped around the handle, my other hand reaching for the casserole, I heard something. I froze, tilting my head towards the window. The night was warm and still. I could see warm yellow light glowing in the neighbor's windows. A perfect caricature. Did you hear that? My husband didn't seem to be paying attention, fiddling with a loose leg of his chair. What do you mean? I... I thought I heard something. Before I could dismiss it as delusion, it came again. It was a sound like a cat with its tail being stomped on, a faint yet blood-curdling screech. I looked closer at the house, but nothing seemed amiss. There was an even louder moaning sound, and then another scream, far clearer this time. What was that? James asked, now standing. I shook my head. I have no idea. Maybe the neighbors are watching a movie? A crash, and another scream. Something moved in one of the windows, and then the curtains were yanked shut. Should I go and check? I, I can do it. My husband shifted nervously. 
I shook my head. He would do it, but I knew he didn't want to. He had always been skittish, especially at night. I'll go. I grabbed an oven mitt and tossed it at him. It hit his chest and fell to the kitchen floor. Put in the casserole. I'll be right back. The night felt even more quiet when I stepped outside. Almost eerily so. The air felt so heavy and still, like I was standing inside of a painting of a street. My footsteps echoed against the pavement, and I tensed each time another scream rang out from the house. What the hell? I muttered, half out of curiosity, and half just to hear a human voice. I knocked on the front door three times, wiping my sweaty palms on my jeans. I was already starting to regret coming over here, feeling silly for disturbing their night if it really was nothing. Even their porch was pristine. The white paint looked fresh, and even the dolls and toy cars strewn across the railing looked organised. I heard footsteps, and the front door opened a crack. I caught a glimpse of a man's face, his jaw square and dusted with stubble. Good evening, Adeline. He greeted me. Hi, I said, my voice coming out far softer than I meant for it to. Good, good evening, I... Uh, I thought I heard something. Is everything okay? He hesitated, then smiled. It looked a little forced. He opened the door wider, and I had to stop myself from flinching. His white button down was stained with flecks of blood, bright red and fresh. There was a child clinging to his pant leg, a little boy that I didn't recognize. Everything is all right. He told me, tussling the boy's hair absent-mindedly. My wife is just going into labor. Oh! I exclaimed, blinking at him in shock. He seemed incredibly calm, considering the circumstances. Should we call someone? An ambulance? No. He said quickly, his smile fading the tiniest bit. No, that's quite all right. Thank you for your concern. This isn't her first rodeo, so to speak. He chuckled stiffly. Oh, okay. Well... Um, tell her congratulations. Will do. He seemed to look me up and down, and a shiver creeped up my spine. Well, have a lovely night. And we're so happy you moved in. He went to close the door on me, turning away. But at the last second... The little boy shoved his hand through the crack. A piece of notebook paper fluttered to the slats of the porch, and the door closed with a sharp click. I picked up the piece of paper, somewhat stunned, as another scream ricocheted inside my head. I unfolded it slowly, holding it under the porch light and squinting to make out what the shaky scratches of red crayon read. Mummy makes lots of babies. It was only a week later that I got a call on the house phone. I was in the bath and I ran to the kitchen, a towel wrapped around my waist and my hair dripping warm water down my back. Hello, I said into the receiver, clutching the phone with both hands. Somehow, I already knew who it would be. Hello, Adeline. Her voice was just as cheerful as it had been the first day we'd moved in. 
like a jingling bell hanging from the door of a shop. How are you, dear? I'm fine, I replied, my eyebrows cinching into an involuntary frown. How are you? How's the baby? What? She sounded genuinely confused, but only for a second. Oh, the baby is just fine. Such a miracle of life, isn't it? Yeah, such a miracle. That's amazing. I'm so happy for you. Yes. So, listen. I was hoping you and your husband would come by tonight for a little dinner party. I made tuna casserole. Please, please say you will. I swallowed. Something about her was beginning to unnerve me. Something about how perky she was only days after labour. But I still didn't want to be rude. And it wasn't like I didn't like her. I didn't want to pass up any friends. Especially when they lived just next door. Mm, of, of course. I said, hoping she could hear my polite smile. We'll be there. I clutched my Tupperware of cookies tightly to my chest, as James guided me up the front steps. I prayed they wouldn't be able to tell that they were store-bought, although I was sure they wouldn't say anything even if they did. James knocked on the door, then tutted, and picked at some chipped white paint next to the peephole. Hmm, looks like they need a new paint job out here. Maybe I should offer... Babe, that's rude. I told him, a strange feeling twisting in my stomach. Something was off, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Our neighbour threw open the door, beaming at us. She was wearing a pink flowery dress and a white apron. I'm so glad you could make it. Come on in, come on in. Everyone's waiting in the dining room. I couldn't help but stare at her stomach, which seemed almost as large as it had been the day we'd met. I glanced at my husband, but he didn't seem to have noticed anything, and only smiled at me reassuringly. Admittedly, I didn't know as much as I could about childbirth, but I knew your stomach stayed large for at least a few days. Surely her body just hadn't recovered yet. Their dining room was larger than ours, or maybe that was just the way it was decorated. It was minimal. The only personal items I could see were more toys. At their long dining table, there were six places set. A little girl sat at one of them, quietly playing with a Barbie doll, and a teenager sat next to her scowling at us. I didn't recognize either of them. This couple seemed so young. How could they have a teenager already? Some people started early, I guess. I had assumed dinner party meant there would be more people, but I felt guilty for assuming that. They were so eager to spend time with us. Maybe they just didn't have many other friends, especially with so many children running around. Across from the kids sat her husband, grinning at us. I blinked. He didn't look how I remembered him. Hadn't her husband been a brunette? This man's hair was a lighter brown, almost a dirty blonde, and his face seemed softer. It must have just been the lighting, I told myself. Surely in the dark, his features had just looked bleak and more severe. The woman immediately started bustling around in the kitchen, and James and I took our seats. I stared at the glass of wine already set out in front of me, the dark red liquid reminding me suddenly of that night, 
of the blood splattered across the man's shirt. James began chatting up the husband, but I couldn't bring myself to keep up. I just stared into the glass, swirling the wine around, watching it lap up against the rim. It was so dark, almost black. We didn't even know these people's names. Were we so rude that we had never asked? Was was that a bug? I dipped my finger into my wine and fished out a small fly, still buzzing desperately. Looking around quickly, I flicked it off my finger into the ground, not wanting to embarrass our hosts. Such a lovely home, James was saying, and I smiled and nodded as if I had been listening. Yes, I butt in, and then hesitated. Forgive me, but I've forgotten your name. The man's grin didn't falter. Joseph, he said happily. No need to apologize. I'm Joseph. And your wife? Dinner is served. The woman called, interrupting me. She wielded a large dish which gave off a faint fishy aroma, setting it down with a flourish in the centre of the table. Thank goodness, honey. I'm starving. Joseph tucked his napkin into his shirt and picked up his fork and knife clutching them in both hands cartoonishly. I looked at James, searching for any semblance of confusion. I found none, only a polite smile. This is the children's favourite dish, she told us, taking my husband's plate. How many kids do you have? Here you are, love, she said scooping a helping of casserole onto his plate and reaching over me to set it down in front of him. As she leaned over me, I caught a glimpse of her face. Her skin seemed to glisten around her eyes, like it was wet. Growing boys need to eat. James chuckled nervously, the first hint I'd gotten of anything amiss. <laughs> That's what I keep telling Adeline. (laughs) Joseph laughed uproariously, pounding his fists on the table. I caught the teenager jump, and the little girl set down her barbie. But I couldn't decipher the expression on either of their faces. A man after my own heart. He cried, and he didn't stop laughing. What did you bring us? The woman asked after a moment, nodding at the Tupperware, having to raise her voice to be heard over her husband's laughter. I swallowed. Chocolate chip cookies. (gasps) Lovely. I gazed down at the food she'd put out in front of me. It smelled even fishier up close. Nothing like the first one she'd given us. I picked up my fork, picking at a flaky corner. A fishbone stuck to the prongs, long and slender and sharp. I hope you'll eat it all. The woman said to me, leaning over so close her blonde curls tumbled onto my shoulder. She smelled of perfume and faintly of fish. Now that she was close to me, I could see clearly that her face was, in fact, wet. You simply must get used to eating for two. After that dinner, it wasn't that I was avoiding them but I didn't make much of an effort to get any closer. I felt deeply uncomfortable, in a way that I didn't quite like to think about. Even so, I told myself it wasn't them. 
we just had gotten busy. James had started his new job in the city, starting construction on a new shopping mall, and I had a big interview coming up. I simply didn't have much time to think about our neighbours. Not that they didn't make it difficult not to. Neither of us got much sleep anymore. The sound of a crying baby kept us up and made us restless. They baffled me during the day too. One Monday, before James had gotten home, I noticed a man out in their yard, playing with a few of the children. He was chasing them around the swings, around and around, and they were shrieking with glee. My curiosity got the better of me. Was this an uncle? A babysitter? I knew little to nothing about this family, and I figured that was what was unnerving me so much. Maybe if I knew more, I would feel comfortable living next to them. Before I could stop myself, I walked out, watched them play for another moment before speaking. Hi, I called out, and all four of them turned to face me. Hello, I'm Adeline, I live next door. Sorry to be nosy, I was just wondering, how are you related to the family? The man smiled at me just like the rest of them, widely. Up close he looked even older, maybe in his forties. He must be a relative of some sort. Don't be sorry, Adeline. I'm their son. We've been so happy that you moved in. After that, I put even more distance between myself and the neighbours. I was sure there was a logical explanation for all of this. But if I thought too hard about it, I felt like my brain would explode. A couple of nights later, James had had enough. That's it. He muttered against my shoulder, squeezing me from behind. I'm going over there. I groaned, rolling over and pressing our noses together. Even with my eyes crossed, I could see his dark circles, and his hair stuck up wildly from tossing and turning. Mm, don't, honey. I whispered, my voice raspy. It's okay. It's not their fault. Surely they can do something. He argued, gently running his fingers through my hair despite his abrasive tone. Jesus, it's almost louder with the windows closed. How many babies do they have over there anyways? I paused and thought about his question, and I listened. I hadn't realised, but he was right. The crying didn't sound like one infant. It sounded like a whole chorus. I can do it if you want. I muttered, but he shook his head. No, 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 no. It's okay. I'll go. You went last time. He pulled back the covers and got to his feet reaching for his pants next to the bedside table. I sat up and watched him get dressed. And once he had kissed me and walked downstairs, I stood up to peer blearily through the bedroom window. It was raining that night, the first rain we'd seen since moving in. It made the neighbor's house look much older than it was, almost like a haunted house. In the darkness and the storm, it almost looked dilapidated. I watched my husband tread through the mud, smiling at how goofy he looked carrying our purple umbrella. I watched him march up the front steps, shaking the water off of himself and knocking on the front door. I remember it so vividly. 
It wasn't a dream. I remember him knocking, and then, so quickly it was unnatural, the front door opened. I didn't see who was behind it, but I saw a bright flash of light and heard a deafening gunshot. And my husband fell to the porch. His chest was eviscerated. Blood and guts spewed out onto the wood. My husband's warm body still twitching. I remember staring, shaking in complete shock. I remember seeing curtains parting from the corner of my eye. But I couldn't pull my eyes away from his body. I remember everything going black, like static taking over my vision and falling. I was surrounded by red, red meat and blood, and a sticky white substance. I was naked and wet, and I couldn't move. All my limbs were cramped up against my body. I felt a pull, pulling me, sucking me down into the redness and the darkness. I heard a woman's voice, a woman's voice muffled and distant, screaming and sobbing. No, I don't want to. Please, I don't want any more. I saw a bright light, and I woke up in my bed, gasping for air, drenched in sweat. My husband sat up next to me, woken no doubt by my violent cries. He pulled me against my chest, stroking my hair, but I wouldn't stop shaking. It's okay, it's okay, just a dream. But it wasn't just a dream. I saw it. I had seen him die. It had been so real, so vivid. I was still mourning, still in shock, curled up in his lap. It couldn't have been a dream. She brought me a pie the next day, the wife. James had stayed home from work to console me, deeply alarmed by my reaction to what he thought was just a bad dream. He offered to get the door, but I didn't want him to. I didn't want him anywhere near a front door ever again. I turned the knob with shaking hands. And there she stood, her hair tied up in a messy ponytail, clutching a pie tin in front of her. She was still pregnant. She held it out to me her smile gleaming and wide, but her eyes apologetic. I wanted to apologize for the noise, she said cheerfully, tilting her head. I hope it hasn't kept you up. It's just so difficult sometimes with newborns. You of all people would understand. I don't have kids, I said bluntly eyeing the pie. It must have been cherry, it was so red. So red. Remember? She blinked at me. Oh, yes, of course. She held out the pie, pushing it into my hands. Please, take it. I cautiously took it from her. It was so red inside, like the red from my dream, like my husband's guts. When I looked back, she was still smiling, but there were tears streaming down her face and dripping off of her chin. I stared at her blankly. Are you okay? <laughs> hmm? Yes. Oh, yes. I'm fantastic. Dear. Without warning, she opened her arms and pulled me in, hugging me tightly, the pie tin crumbling between us. We're just... we're so glad you moved in. 
I heard a sound like water trickling, and I cringed as something wet touched my legs. I pulled back and looked down to see liquid trickling down her thighs, slightly pink and sticky. Um, you... Uh... She raised her eyebrows inquisitively, then looked down at herself and seemed to blush. Oh, my... Yes, you must excuse me. She gave me another smile, so wide it looked like it might hurt, still weeping silently. She looked older than before. I'm so sorry. Again, I'm so sorry. She killed herself a couple of days later. I saw it happen. I felt an urge to look out of our bedroom window around five in the morning, and I saw her standing on the roof of the neighbor's house. She seemed to look at me right in the eyes before she plummeted. I ran down the stairs as quickly as I could, almost tripping and cracking my head open. When I got outside, everything looked different. The house looked different. Old like it hadn't been lived in in years. The yard was overgrown, the grass swallowing up the children's toys, and the pink flowers on the window sills were shriveled and brown. The porch was dirty and packed with things, as if only hoarders had ever resided there. The paramedics came after I called 911, and the police, and it occurred to me that it was the first time I had seen anyone other than us and the neighbours on that street. They told me it was a good thing I had called, because no one else would have. When I asked what they meant, they just looked at me blankly. No one else lives here, ma'am. One of them told me, as if it were obvious. I stared at her body until they took her away. She looked different. She looked old. Even so, I could have sworn I saw her stomach growing. I heard them call her Jane Doe as they zipped up the black body bag. That was a few months ago. We moved back into our apartment, closer to the city. But even though it's cramped here, it feels so much more comfortable. I've been going to therapy, and trying desperately to figure out if what I witnessed was real or pure insanity. My therapist seems to think it was stress. Somehow, so does my husband. As if he wasn't there. As if he didn't see what I did. Hmm. He seems different. I've noticed things. Like how the mole on the back of his wrist is gone now, and how his hair grows slightly curly when it used to be so straight. I can't get the image of him that night out of my head. His body destroyed and drenched in gore. His eyes still open. I've been throwing up every morning, but I won't test. I'm terrified to confirm what I already know. <laughs>